Welcome to CS2050. The topic of the second half is going to be on permutations, uh, combinations, and uh, the binomial theorem. <coughs> uh, so you guys perhaps colloquially may know what a permutation or a combination is. You guys know what a factorial is? Everyone have seen a factorial? N factorial we define to be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times dot, 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 times uh, 2 times 1, right? Um, what is zero factorial pop quiz? One. Why? Because it's 1 factorial divided by 1. Correct. That's actually a great, that's a much simpler answer than what I was thinking of. Do you know another reason why it's zero factorial is 1? It is 1 factorial divided by 1, but there's another reason. Anyway, when I was in calculus, I learned that the, the generalization of the factorial is the gamma function, right? You guys maybe vaguely remember seeing that some other place. The gamma function at 0 is 1. For it to be a sufficient generalization, that it makes sense. We, we will need this fact that zero factorial is 1 a lot of times, because we'll have base cases of things, right? Um, so n factorial is a really powerful tool, and today we'll talk about its relevance with uh, permutations. n factorial is itself just an interesting number, but it's also the number of ways to put something in uh, what's called a permutation. And a permutation you can think of as an ordering. Of something. So if you have, have n items, uh, there are how many ways to put them, as in arrange them in sequence? Sorry, what? Here's the proof. Suppose you have n spots, OK? Um, you're arranging a marching band of people who, who doesn't really matter. How many ways do you have to choose the first person? You have n people. You want to put them in line somehow. There's n ways to choose the first person. OK. Now you want to choose the second person. But you've already chosen the first person. So how do you choose the second person? You can't choose the same person to be the first and the second person. Someone can't come in first and second place. So how many options do you have for the second place? N minus 1. Yes, you have n minus 1 options. How many options do you have for the third place? N minus 2. Yeah. How many options do you have for the last place? 1. There's one guy left over. He gets the last spot. What is that? That's n times n minus 1 times n minus 2. By the product rule, we're simply going to get that this is just n factorial. right? The factorial comes up all the time in all kinds of interesting, uh, really, really like not uh, easy areas. One of my uh, the pieces of research I did as, as when I was an undergrad in math was counting the number of, trying to count the number of ways that you could place n queens. You guys play chess? You guys know what the queen does in chess, right? It was forwards, backwards, diagonally. How many ways could you place the n queens on a n by n chess board such that no two queens were attacking each other? Kind of a difficult problem. It's been solved now in like 2020 or something. Um, it's a really, really hard to calculate problem. The n rooks problem is actually far easier. Suppose I give you an n by n chess board. Right? And we want to place n rooks. You guys know what the rook does? The castle thing, right? That's a rook. You guys know what a rook you, guys, you know what? Okay. Um, if I have n by n board, how many ways are there to place a rook? Right. We want to place n rooks on an n by n board. Maybe we start with eight. We'll place eight rooks on an eight by eight board such that no two rooks are attacking each other. The rook, well, let's say we place a rook on the first row. Okay. How many choices do we have to place a rook on the first row? There's n ways. You could pick here, you could pick here, you could pick here, you could pick here, and so on. There are n ways. Now, when you place a rook, it's going to cancel out the entire row. 
and it's going to also cancel out the entire column, right? So consider you want to place another rook on the next row. How many ways are there to place a rook on the next row? Sorry? Two ways to place a rook on the next row? N square minus 2n plus 1. Consider just the second row. 7. 7? N minus 1, if we were working on N minus 4. You can choose anywhere on the row except directly under the previous rook. So it's N minus 1 choices. Say I put him here. Okay? He's going to cancel out this whole row and also this column. By the product rule, we have at least have n times n minus 1 number of ways. How many ways are there to place the third rook? n minus 2. n minus 2. Say I place them here. Cancels out that whole row and whole column. How many ways are there to place n rooks on an n by n board such that no two rooks are attacking each other? n factorial ways. Given an n by n board, an 8 by 8 board perhaps, you can place n rooks on the board such that no two are attacking each other. Um, you can do so n factorial different ways. Now, when you do counting, you have to be careful what it means by a way. It's usually context dependent. For example, in this context, if you rotate the board, we don't consider that, we consider that a different way. If you flip the board upside down, we consider that a different way. It's like coordinates are fixed, right? Um, give me a specific way to put n rooks on an n by n board. Like, describe me a specific way to put n rooks on an n by n board. Diagonal. Yeah, diagonal. They're not attacking each other, right? Rooks can't attack on diagonals. So. Uh, n factorial ways to put n rooks on an n by n board. Um, let's say you have questions on that example, right? Now the queen, the, the, the queen version of this problem is much harder, and perhaps you guys see why. Because not only does it block off exactly one row below it and the whole, one row and the next row, one, the whole column and the whole row, but it also blocks off diagonals, right? But what if it's on the edge? It doesn't exactly block off two diagonals, it blocks off one or two diagonals, right? So it's, it's a very complicated problem. I think it's only been manually, manually computed up to like n equals 26 or something. We still don't know like large n, what this number is. Uh, right. So let's suppose you don't want to, now this is called a permutation. A permutation is when you put items in order. You have n items, you put them in some ordering. You arrange them in a line in some way. We call that a permutation. What, if, what we call is an R permutation. Uh, an R permutation is given uh, n items, how many ways to put R of them in order. So we don't want to put all n of them in order. We only want to choose R of them and put those R in order, OK? How many ways can we do that? Well, we want to only want to arrange R of the items, OK? So we're only going to have R blanks. How many ways are there to choose the first item? N. n. Exactly, there's N. Because you have N items, we're arranging R of them. There's still N ways to choose the first item. How many ways are there to choose the second item? n minus 1. Third item is going to be n minus 2. What's the last item? How many ways are there to choose the last item? No. Close. Almost. Consider r to be 3 and consider n to be a billion. Okay, There's definitely not one way to choose the last guy. There's still like a billion people left. Almost a billion people left, right? It's almost n minus r. N minus r plus 1. So the number of r permutations is going to be n times n minus 1 times a dot. Oh, sorry. n minus 2 times 
n minus r plus 1. But if you think about it, it's almost a factorial. It just doesn't finish. So consider we wrote out the factorial, and let's see what happens. This is the number of r permutations. We'll call this p of n comma r, OK? Given n items, how many ways are there to form an r permutation of the n items? We'll call that p n comma r. Consider the difference between that and n factorial. n factorial is going to be n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot, 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 n minus r plus 1. But then it's going to keep going. It's going to be what comes next, n minus r, right? n minus r minus 1, 1, right? What is this? R factorial. R factorial? N minus R factorial. N minus R factorial. Right? So in fact, the difference between P and R, the number of R permutations of an N element set, and the difference between N factorial is simply multiplication by this N minus R factorial. So in fact, we can derive a better form of p n comma r as what? What is p n comma r equal to then in terms of n factorial? n factorial over n minus r factorial. Yes. You simply take the factorial, but then you don't count, you don't arrange all n elements. You just don't arrange the last n minus r of the elements. So then you divide by n minus r factorial. Um, one of those things that, again, this formula is pretty easy to memorize. If you, you, you'll, you'll look at a problem and you'll be like, OK, I'm arranging elements, or order matters, or order doesn't matter, or something like this. Some rule, product rule. Here, specifically, the elements are in order. That doesn't matter. The, there is a distinction made between the first and the second and the seventh item in the list. And I'm only arranging r of them, right? Pop quiz, what is, what should p of n comma n be? Yeah, why? n factorial is because, well, you plug in r there, you get n minus n is 0. Factorial is 1, so you get n factorial over 1 is going to be n factorial. So the formula does check out, but what is it supposed to mean? When you write pn comma n, you have n items, and you arrange n of them in order. That's just an n permutation of n, uh, n items, which is just the, what we would call a permutation. That's just the default permutation, which we know is n factorial as we did previously, right? So that settles it. Um, makes sense. Right, any questions on the uh, R permutation before we do a quick example? OK. Uh, how many ways are there to form? Let's consider that you have the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G, OK? Uh, yeah, let's say you have, uh, let's give it some more letters, H. Let's say you have these letters. How many ways are there to, are there to arrange these letters in order? In a, how many strings can you make with these letters? One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. There's eight factorial. There's eight letters. So you can. There's eight factorial ways to do it. Again, eight ways to choose the first letter. Seven ways to choose the second letter. Six ways to choose the th third letter, and so on. So there's eight factorial ways to do it. How many ways are there to do it, uh, such that A, B, and C are next to each other? So first off, this eliminates, for example, B being the first letter. This eliminates A being the last letter. What else does it eliminate? B being the last letter. It eliminates C being the first letter and some other options. Right? And it eliminates C coming before the B or anything like this. Right? So it's not obvious how to count the number of ways to do this. Um, does anyone have an idea, like an easy way to count the number of ways to do this? What, here's a bad idea. Don't do this. List out all eight factorial strings and then start marking them off. 
Does anyone have an estimate of, someone calculator estimate for me what 8 factorial is? I'm not writing down 40,000 things on the board. That's a bad way to do it. The computer could do it for you. Actually, that's not too bad, right? You write a for loop and just say, if it, does, if it has ABC as a substring, great, you know? Um, but there's an easy way, actually, to attack a problem like this. Do we have any ideas? Just pull, this is not something I think we should know yet, but just pulling the audience. Is there an... Just count ABC as its own element. Yeah, OK. So instead of counting the number of ways, the diverse ways you could insert A and insert B and insert C and then maybe uncounting those. What you can do is just pretend ABC is a letter. So instead of counting strings of length 8, I'm going to count strings of length 6. So I'm going to have D, E, F, G, H. Those are going to be untouched. But then I'm going to invent a new special letter called ABC. Okay? It's going to squish all the letters together into one letter. That's one letter. Okay? That's one letter. How many letters do I have now? Okay, now wherever I arrange this substring of this, every string of this is really a string of length, every string here of length 6 is really a string of length 8, but exactly when A, B, C are next to each other. I'm not choosing A, B, and C separately as we do for the permutation. I'm choosing them all together. If I choose A, I'm choosing A, uh, B, and C. Those are forced. I'm choosing B, A has already been chosen, and C is going to be chosen next. I don't get to make those decisions. What is the number of ways to arrange these many symbols into a string of length 6? Six? 6 factorial. 6 factorial. Here's where the combinatorial proof kind of gets like, where's the actual bijection? What are you writing down? I claim that the number of ways to arrange A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, with such that A, B, C are adjacent, is equivalent to the number of ways of arranging A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, where A, B, C is one letter. Now, that is bijective. You should convince yourself immediately. I'm not presenting the literal bijection between the, string, the strings of length 6 and the strings of length 8, but you should believe that it's there. Right? Questions on that? 6 factorial. What is 6 factorial? 720. So we went from 4 of uh, 40,096 or something. Only 720 of them satisfied that property. Not too many of them. Pretty low fraction. Um, let's do another one. Uh, you recall the definition of an injective function. What is a, let, let says, let's say we have A of size N and B of size uh, M. And we recall that, a, consider a function from A to B, okay? Do we recall the definition of an injective function? So, Uh, it's like, yeah, f of, let's say f of x is equal to f of y implies x equals y, right? Basically, picture-wise, it's like, you will not have this. That cannot happen. Two distinct, distinctness in the domain maps to distinctness in the codomain, right? In fact, this is actually the contrapositive of uh, what an injective function means, but it's easier to prove the contrapositive, so we just always take that definition. Um, how many injective functions are there in terms of n and m, right? We want to count the number of ways that we can compute an injective function. Suppose that we have m greater than n. Let me make sure I got these, these letters exact. Give me just a second. Let's not count. Let's swap these. So we want an in, injective function from an m element set to an n element set. How many ways are there? If m is greater than n, are there, how many injections are there from an m element set to an n element set if m is greater than n? m is greater than n, we have a bigger thing there and a smaller thing there, right? How many injections should there be in terms of m and n? P, m, n. Mm, no, no. If we assume m is greater than n. Injectivity is important for us here. We can consider the number of functions in general, but let's suppose we're considering uh, injective functions. Okay. 
Injectivity, if we don't have that picture above, we know that it's an inject it looks like an injection, like a shot. But we ran out of things. Where does that map to? That must map to something here, and therefore not be injective, right? So the answer, if m is greater than n, we have 0. There are 0 injections if m is greater than n, right? So that may not be too surprising. But suppose, then, that n is less than or equal to m. No. m is less than or equal to n, OK? We know there are 0 injections there. So we may suppose we're just counting the ones where m is less than or equal to n. How many injections are there? Again, if m is less than or equal to n, it looks like this, and we're good, right? Something like this. It need not be surjective. But how many injections should there be? P n. P n. Let me double check I got m and n correct. So the first item in this is, let's say, let's work it out a little bit. Let's say a is equal to its size m. So we have a1 to a m, right? B has n elements, so we'll call it B1 to the Bn, right? F of A1 has n choices, right? F of A2 has, if it's injective, it cannot map the, to the same choice that A1 mapped to, right? We cannot have it mapping to the same one. So there are n minus 1 choices, right? We product those together by the product rule. We're going to get uh, n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 times dot, dot, dot. The mth item can choose how many items of b? n minus m. m, let me double check. I have n minus m plus 1, I think. Is that correct? Double check me on this, please. That's, as you said, is going to be P uh, M N, right? M -M. I think so, yes. Yes. Yes, OK. N is, great. N is greater than M. Yes, correct. So that's the number of injective functions from a set of size N to a set of, excuse me, from a set of size M to a set of size N. We can count the number of functions. It's just the number. Of, it's just an m permutation of n elements. That's all a function really is, then, right? An injective function is then a permutation. Um, how many functions are there in general? So forget injectivity, forget surjectivity. We have an n, and forget that m is greater than or equal to n or anything like this, okay? Because we don't need to split it up like that. We have two sets. This one, and let's suppose the total functions. The function is total, so that every element of the domain is mapped somewhere in the codomain. How many choices are there for the first element? If this is a set of size m, this is a set of size n. N choices. n choices. How many choices are there for the second element? N choices. N choices. Third is m ch n choices, n choices, n choices, right? So if you have a function from, it doesn't matter they map to the same thing at all. We're forgetting injectivity, surjectivity. It doesn't matter here. Just the number of functions in general. Um, how many functions then are there from a set of size m to a set of size n? n over n to the n. n to the m. So there are n to the m possible functions, and there's only p of n m injective functions. Far fewer injective functions than there are functions. Right. You could perhaps I'll leave it as an exercise for you to count. Try to count the number of Surjective functions. Right. Any questions on this? Do we understand this argument? Right. Again, like things maybe you've done in grade school, but in a uh, slightly more challenging setting, right? Suppose we want to count the number of uh, ways, like a permutation, to order things, but we don't want to care about order, right? So that doesn't really, I guess, make sense. Why would we want to count the order of something without ordering it? But there are certain, several mathematical objects which are unordered. Can you name an unordered mathematical object? Irrational numbers are ordered because you can compare them. What is a set of objects that it doesn't really matter what way you write them in?
Say it again? Oh. I, maybe it's not a well-worded question on my part, but the answer I'm looking for is a set. The, the elements of a set doesn't really matter. You write it, write it in, unlike a permutation, right? Um, right, we say the sets uh, 1, 2 is equal to the set 2, 1. As sets, those are equal, but as permutations, 2, 1 is not equal to 1, 2, right? Per if you order the elements, if order matters, then these two are not equal. If order doesn't matter, then these are equal, right? So we want to count the number of ways to choose k elements from n elements. If you have, let's say you have n elements. Let's write this. We'll write this like this. It's called a binomial coefficient. You may have, have you guys seen this choose operation somewhere? Yeah. n choose k. Uh, this is set as n choose k. It's like equal to the number of ways to choose a k element subset of uh, from n elements. Okay, we want to choose a k element subset of n elements, right? Uh, let's just ju let's just before we derive the formula for this, we're going to extend our intuition about uh, how many ways are there to do something. How many ways are there to choose n elements of n elements? If order doesn't matter. I give you n elements. I say pick n elements. How many ways are there to do that? If order doesn't matter. Sorry. No. I only ask trick questions, right? If I give you n elements, there's one. There's one way. If I give you n elements and I say pick n elements, how many ways are there to pick n elements? One. Now. By an n element set, let's, let me expand a little bit then. We have 1, 2, n. The elements are distinct. There's no duplicates, right? There's not infinite copies of each element or anything like this. You have n items. You want to choose k of them. Just pick k of them. And then, and then the, the set doesn't matter except for its size, right? So you want to choose n elements of n elements. Well, there's only one way you choose them all, right? Another trick question, how many ways are there to choose no elements? If I give you n elements and I say pick none of them, how many ways can you do that? One. one. This is almost philosophical. There is one way to do nothing. That's still, a, that's still a way. Okay. How many ways if I say, if I give you n items, I say pick one. Okay, you're at the prize booth and you won a prize. How many ways are there to choose, choose an, a prize? If you have n choices, you want to choose one prize. How many ways are there to choose one prize? And, and there's n choices, right? What if, how many ways are there to choose two prizes? Let's do this last one. This one's a tricky one. Or n times n minus 1. Almost. No, no, it is n times n minus 1, but there's one thing missing. Yes. n times n minus 1 over 2. Choose the first item. It's the same as the Gauss double sum thing that we did, right? Um, let's then choose two. Right. So let's try to think about the relationship between a permutation, and this is called a combination. A combination is a selection of items where the order doesn't matter. You just put them in a big rucksack and it's shaking around, right? And certainly, every way that you can order in items is a way to also count the number of ways to have that collection of items unordered. Do we agree? Yes. Um, well, certainly it's a number. Do we agree it's a number? And not a, it's definitely a natural number and not a rational number. Do we agree? Why? Because you can only have natural number of objects. Correct. So we're not concerned with if, is the formula good yet. We're trying to see what the formula should be. So I agree that n choose 2 should be a natural number. But I claim it's this. But why is this, without looking at this, why is this a natural number? It's dividing by 2, so it may not be, in general, a natural number. But why is this still a natural number? 
Yeah, one of these is even, one of them is odd. So it's going to be divide out. They're both not odd. That's basically what I'm seeing, right? So certainly it's a natural number. The number of ways to choose if you have, uh, let's say you have n elements, OK? And you're choosing the num you're counting the number of subsets of size 2. A subset of size 2 includes 1, 2, includes, I don't know, 7, 12. Does not include something like 7, 7, right? How many choices do you have for the first object? n. How many choices do you have for the second object? n minus 1. But this is not, not equal. So it, it is equal to the number of ways to do it in reverse. So you accidentally double count it. So you divide by 2. Interesting here, n times n minus 1 is almost something that we know. We just overcounted by twice, right? So in fact, there is a relationship between the number of ways to order something, to count the orderings of something, and the number of ways to count that same thing but forgetting the order. We divided by 2 here because we overcounted, right? But suppose we divided by, th what would be if we were counting the number of subsets of size 3? We would count the ordered ones, and then we would divide by what? 3? So how many ways are there to arrange 3 elements? 1, 2, 3. How many ways are there to, there to put 3 elements in order? 6, 6. Say so 3 factorial. Right? What I'm saying here is, and what is the number of ways to order three elements. Actually, that is, that is three factor. Given n elements, how many three element orderings are there? n factorial over n minus r factor, n minus three factorial? Right, so n choose k is actually something we already know. It's, this is an unstructured thing, not counting the ordering. But we can count the orderings and then just divide by how much we overcounted by. We, can, we know that's the same way if you have n items and you order k of them, a k permutation of n of items, but we overcounted by how much? Yes. That is just uh, n factorial over k factorial over n minus k factorial. Mathematics is supposed to be pure and independent of meaning. It's just manipulating symbols on the board. But when you have something like this, you should always double check that it corresponds to what we want it to be. You know, take some measurements. Now, notice you take that as your formula. You plug in our values here, which we just computed from intuition, not from like uh, the formula. We we'll just check the formula is right. What happens if you plug in n k equals n? Do you get one? You'll get. N minus N is 0, so that's 1 factorial, that's 1. K factorial is going to be N factorial, so N, N factorial over N factorial, you'll get, N, you'll get 1. What if you plug in 0 for K? You're going to have 0 factorial here. You're going to have N minus 0, which is N factorial, you're going to get 1 as well. What if you plug in 2? You're going to have N factorial over 2 factorial of N minus 2 factorial, which is going to give you on the numerator N times N minus 1, and the denominator is just going to be 2. Right? So you plug in these values, you get the same thing. So this is... This appears on the surface to be the correct formula, right? Let's do one quick application of it, right? Let's say there are 70 students, and there are, let's say, two teachers, me and Harandi, right, this summer. How many ways are there to choose a group of three people? So, sorry, one more time. 22? 70? 72? Uh, uh, I guess n k with n equal to 70, and uh, 72 and k equal to 3. Exactly. 
You have 72 people, and you're going to choose three of them. That, I worked it out, I think. I have 59,640. Big number. We only have 72 people, OK? But there's 60,000 ways to choose a group of three. It's kind of a lot. We only can't count that high. No one's ever counted that high ever, right? Um, Here's an interesting application we see of the formula. We can prove it just by a sort of a plug and chug, but we can also prove it by uh, a combinatorial argument. Okay, let's try to let's try to prove this by a combinatorial argument. Uh, n choose k, I claim, is equal to n choose n minus k. Right? What I'm saying here is that n choose n is equal to n choose 0. n choose 1 is equal to n choose n minus 1. n choose 2 is equal to n choose n minus 2, and so on. Right? Why is this true? Well, first off, you can just go plug and chug it. That's un, uh, I mean, that's like uh, boring, I guess. Right? Plug in a, replace every instance of k with n minus k. This is going to be n. If you plug every instance with k, you're going to get, um, again, the formula of n choose k is going to be equal to n factorial over k factorial over n minus k factorial, right? And then n minus, n choose n minus k is going to be equal to n factorial over n minus k factorial over n minus n minus k factorial. What is n minus n minus k factorial? k factorial. Yeah, so that's just going to be... In a boring way, we just like plugged and chugged it, and we got the same answer, right? But there's the point of this is like combinatorial proofs, right? Give me an explanation for that. Explain that to me by counting. Like the number of ways to do something is the number of ways to do something else. What's a good explanation for that? Things have reasons, you know? Yes. Oh. Say if you have like, uh, if we're saying like n is four and k is one, so if you have like a bag of like four marbles and you want to choose one marble out of the bag, it's the same amount of just not choosing one marble, I guess. Exactly. Choosing k items. is the same as not choosing k from n. No, not choosing n minus k from n. If you have n items, you pick three. The distinction between choosing and not choosing doesn't really matter. When you say, I, I'm going to pick those three marbles, what you're also saying equivalently and exactly is that I'm not choosing these n minus three marbles. Forget those other ones. If you have four marbles and you choose one, the choice of you making a choice of one marble is exactly the same as, the, as you rejecting three marbles. I don't want these three marbles. That's you choosing three marbles, right? So we see choosing one marble is equal to not choosing three marbles. That's the combinatorial proof, QED, right? You, maybe you can see you should develop a skill of the combinatorial proof argument. Again, in the background, it relies on the fact that you know cardinality of A is equal to cardinality of B, if and only if there exists a bijection uh, from A to B. But the bijection is never ever like really made too explicit. We just simply say, oh, that thing, that's exactly the number of ways to do this other thing. Done. So you just the bijection is sometimes implicitly defined and not too rigorous. But uh, it's obvious to, especially to combinatorialists, how this works, right? Questions on that? We gave sort of two proofs of the same thing, right? Now, what's an application of this? Let's say you're choosing something really big. Let's say you have like 100 choose 99. If you were to work this out, you would have like 100 factorial, and then you would have 
99 factorial, and then you would have to work those out, and then you divide, and then you'd have 2 factorial. It's annoying. But by applying this theorem, you know that's just the same as just n choose n minus k, which is going to be 100 choose 1, right? That's easy. We know that one. Just choose one marble, you know? And maybe this is not a good example. Suppose I put like 87 here or something, right? It's easier to choose a, to compute the smaller binomial coefficient. These choose operations are sometimes also called binomial coefficients, right? for a reason we'll talk about soon. All right, let me give you one more identity, and we'll do a combinatorial proof of it. Questions are still on this so far, right? Uh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Yes. So how would like, if you use like 187 or whatever? How would it be easier to compute if you're using the same numbers to compute equations? If you're like a naive middle schooler or something, and you know before you compute 100 factorial over 87 factorial. Some people may compute 100 factorial and then compute 87 factorial and then divide the two instead of computing 100 factorial over 87 factorial is 100 times dot, 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 all the way to 88. Some people don't do it that way, which is not good. But if you do it the, the, the bad way, this can make it easier. A, a, a better version of you will just know that those are the same and you, you know the best way to compute those. So it's not, if you're good, it's not helpful. If you're bad, it may be helpful. Sometimes in proofs, I suppose it could also be helpful. Okay, this is going to be called, uh, this is called Pascal's identity. It's that uh, n choose k is actually equal to n minus 1 choose k uh, plus uh, n minus 1 choose k minus 1. Okay. Now, how would you prove that? Bad way to work it out. Convert every n choose k into n factorial over n minus k factorial, divide by k factorial, and then you like distribute, you undistribute, you move stuff around, it's ugly. Maybe you could do it with some product rule stuff. We can actually give, I'm, arithmetic always will work, okay? But combinatorial proof is really powerful. So I'm trying to do, without filling up the whole board full of divisions and multiplications, we can argue this uh, combinatorially. What we're gonna do is instead of proving this, we're gonna prove something similar. We're gonna prove n plus one choose k is equal to n choose k, plus uh, n choose k minus 1. Let me double check I have this exact. Yes. Do you agree those are the same? All I did is I'm just going to prove it for the case of n plus 1. Same stuff. For any numbers n and k, right? Um, combinatorial proof. What is a set of n plus 1? So n plus, n, n plus 1 choose k. Let's call this that you have n students and one teacher. N plus 1 choose k is the number of ways to form a group of k, a set of k people, a set of k from n students and one teacher, okay? Num ways to choose a set of size k from n students one teacher, okay? The teacher, of course, is not special or distinct in some sense. It's just there. Um, but the, suppose we're now counting the number of ways to choose a set of size k from n students and one teacher. By the sum rule, we know that this is actually equal to something else. This is equal to the number of ways to choose k people, not including k students, including teacher, uh, plus k minus 1 students, including teacher. 
So every set either chooses the teacher or doesn't choose the teacher, right? Every one, every single group that's possible to make as a combination contains the teacher or it doesn't contain the teacher. Those are the only two possibilities. If it doesn't contain the teacher, well, let's suppose it does contain the teacher first. If it does contain the teacher, you have put the teacher into the chosen set, right? So you can choose k minus 1 remaining spots in the set. But because there's only one teacher, the k minus 1 spots have to be filled by only the students. There's only n students to choose from. You've only chosen one teacher. So this is n students to choose from, right? This is the number of ways to choose a set if you choose the teacher, and you have k minus 1 additional ways to choose students. Right? Now let's suppose, OK, you chose the teacher, but you have to count by the sum rule choosing the teacher or not choosing the teacher. Those are the only two options. So consider that you sum the number of ways to not choose the teacher. If you don't choose the teacher, you only choose, you have k spots left in the set to choose, right? But how many people can you choose from? You will not choose the teacher. So it's not n plus 1. It's from the additional n students. So it's going to be n here. QD. Sum rule, we break it up choosing teacher or not choosing teacher. Uh, this is the number of ways to choose the teacher, number of ways to not choose the teacher. This is the number of ways in general to choose, given n plus 1, one, n plus one people, choose k of them. Yes? So it's n k minus 1 because you subtract a student and add it. Ah, this one, you have, suppose you have a bust of k people, but forget that it's ordered, OK? You have k spots. This corresponds to choosing the teacher. This corresponds to not choosing the teacher. If you've chosen the teacher, the teacher walks under the bus and he sits down. You have k minus 1 spots left. So that has to be filled from the students. You don't have a choice of the other k. But one element has already been determined, k minus 1 remaining. This one, you say, I don't choose the teacher. You kick him out of the class, and you have k spots left on the bus, and there's n students left. So you say, n students go into the bus, whatever, right? n choose maybe yeah. Pascal's identity. Also, perhaps useful in proofs. Um, maybe not. Who knows? Questions on this one? Counting is very interesting because, I mean, you know, first you know, haha, look, we're putting little, how many f flowers are on a petal or something, and suddenly we, we're like uh, thrown into uh, such abstract concepts of, of choices, making choices or not making choices, right? Combinatorics really is, it becomes a science quite fast, right? Questions on this? All right, let's prove the binomial theorem. Have you guys seen the binomial theorem? You guys know what a binomial theorem, the binomial coefficient is? Heard the word binomial in any context? In what context have you heard the word binomial? Uh, in learning about combinatorics. Yes. Well, that's what we're doing today. We're going to prove the binomial theorem. Binomial theorem, I forget. It's due to some famous person, but if... I can't remember. It probably wasn't important enough. Maybe it was Newton or something. Um, these, when we write n choose k, sometimes those are also called binomial coefficients for a specific reason, right? Consider the fact, we, we want to consider like when we factor FOIL numbers, OK? We want to be able to write these efficiently. We do it with some difficulty. What is uh, x plus 1 squared? Plus one. Two x plus one. Who said x plus one? I am. It's fine. <laughs> okay. What about what about x plus one cubed? We're doing the binomial theorem, so we'll never have to do this ourselves. Well, the theorem will do it for us. What is x plus one cubed? X cubed plus three x squared plus three x plus one. Okay. All uh, right. I don't think anyone would get this one. X plus one to the fourth. You shouldn't memorize this one. If you've memorized this one, you already know the binomial theorem. Is it x to the fourth plus well, let's, let's work it out first. So you're going to have unfoiling, OK? It's going to be basically every combination of this one and this one into sequences of four. So this one is going to be an x. So the first one is always going to be x to the n, right? What is the next one going to be? Four. Yes. Plus? 6x squared 
more x plus one to one. Yes. Here's one way to think about this. We write x plus 1 to the fourth. We're giving x plus 1, x plus 1, x plus 1, x plus 1, right? So the number of ways that these multiply together is like the number of choices you can make. You have four digits, and you make one choice per digit. That's one element of the summation, right? Now, if we generalize this, suppose we did, let's say, x plus y to the 4. Forget the 1. We'll do x plus y to the 4. This is going to give us x plus y, x plus y, x plus y, and x plus y, right? So let's suppose we were to FOIL this out. It's going to be every possible choice, 2 to the n choices here, this, right? So we're going to get x, 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 x. I could write that as x to the 4th, but I'm just going to leave it as x, 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 x for now. Okay. Then. Suppose I chose x, 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 and then y. Then I could choose x, x, y, x, and so on. Do we see? Now, forget that multiplication commutes for a second. Forget that x times y is equal to y times x, just, just for a moment. We'll get back to that. But when we work out the product like this, we're going to get basically every possible combination of x and y as a string. Right? The last one is going to be y, 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 right? Notice also here that x, 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 x is going to be x to the fourth. This is going to be x cubed y. This is going to be x squared y. This is going to be x cubed y as well, right? This is going to be, there's going to be an x squared y squared in here, and this is going to be y to the fourth. So the sum is always n. It's always 4. And it's only x or y, right? In fact, we can t I'll tell you the general form of the binomial theorem, that x plus y to the n is equal to the sum from i is equal to 0 to n of n choose i times x to the n minus i uh, times y to the i. Let's take a second to digest what this theorem says before we prove it. And we will prove it. Thankfully, using the combinatorial proof technique, we won't have to do anything insane. Um, if you fix y to be 1 here, we have just powers of x, right? Notice that we have x4, x3, x2, x, and, and x to the 0, right? So actually, look at the coefficients. We have 1, 4, 6, 4, 1. We have 1, 3, 3, 1. Does anyone know the coefficients of x to the 5 off the top of their head? Is it? 5, 10, 10, 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. Yeah. It's going to be uh, x plus 1 to the 5 is going to be like 1, 5, 10, 10, 5, 1. Symmetry, right? This is going to be our n choose 1. That's going to be our n choose n minus 1, which we proved are the same, right? That's going to be our n choose 0. That's going to be our n choose n. That's what basically was going to happen. Um, this is really, really powerful theorem, because you don't have to ever foil anything ever again. If you say, oh, man, I have x to the billion, I'm going write it, to write it out that way. If you have x to the billion and you say you mod by 3 or something, you can compute this very easily, because you know the factorials greater than 3 all have, are divisible by 3. right? So you can compute x, to the billion, x plus y to the billion mod 3 to be very, very, very quickly. right? Things like this. Binomial theorem is very powerful, very, very powerful tool. Um, Let's get on with the proof. Any questions on the statement of the binomial theorem? We'll get on to the proof, and then we'll do some applications of it. So uh, consider x plus y to the n. If we were to FOIL this out, we will get every single possibility of a string of length n containing a mix of x and y's. Do we agree? That should be clear, at least from this example. Right? We're going to get a choice of uh, for the we're going to get a choice of x times y or x times y or x times y or excuse me. A choice of x or y to multiply into it, a choice of x or y to multiply into it, a choice of x or y to multiply into it, a choice of x or y to multiply into it. So in fact, how many strings 
of any number of x's and any number of y's of length n are there. String is ordered, by the way, so forget reordering. n. Suppose we have a string of length n. It only contains two symbols, x or y. How many possible strings of length n are there of only x, symbols x and y? 2 to the n. This is equal to 2 to the n products of uh, x and y. Why is it 2 to the n? Well, x and y don't matter. I mean, that's the same thing as 0 and 1. There are two choices for the first one, two choices for the second one, two choices for the third one. X and Y, or X and Y, and X and Y, right? So, but a lot of them are the same. So we already know that of these two to the n, a lot of them are, can be summed together. So we, we can already say uh, that this is equal to, a s I is equal to one, uh, excuse me, zero to n, some constant ci times X to the n minus i, y to the i, where ci is the number of products of a string of length n with exactly i y's in it. Of n uh, things exactly i of them are y. And the remaining and uh, n minus i are x. If something is not a y, it must be an x, right? Um, well, the number of the products, as we said, is the number of strings. So we want to show, by the way, we want to show that uh, c of i is equal to n choose i. And if we can do that, then we're done. That's what we want to prove. We'll prove. We'll argue combinatorially C, C i is n i, n choose i, right? Um, so we also can say C i is equal, combinatorially, again, the number of n, of length n strings with exactly i y's. So consider a length n string with exactly i y's in it. Something like this. Let's say we only have two y's in a length n string. Okay? We want to count the number of ways that you can have a length n string with i y's in it. What is this? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay? So fix the, let's fix the n, for example, let's, for just an example. Let's say we have 10, a string of length 10 with two y's in it, only two y's in it. But the two y's can appear anywhere. Right? This is valid, right? Something like this. How many ways are there to put two y's into a string of length n? This is a kind of a difficult question. If we can answer this, we'll finish the proof. Give me a bijection between the number of strings to do this and something else that we know. And then we can count that something else easier. N minus i. A bijection between what and what? This, the number of two y's is the same as the number of. That is exactly true. Unfortunately, it doesn't help us with the proof, but that is exactly why the product here is symmetrical. When we, when we work out the theorem, that's exactly why the 4 is the 4, the 6 is in the middle, the 1 is the 1, the 5 is the 5, and the 10 is the 10 is exactly why that's true. But it doesn't help us prove this. It is true that we could choose the y's or choose the x's, and, or, or, choose, or not choose the, we could choose the y's or not choose the x's. Well, you know what I'm saying, right? But it doesn't help us exactly count it. Here's sort of the, 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 the kick I'm looking for. When you have a string like this, you really just need to describe the location of the y's. 
right? So if this is, let's say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The number of ways to count the number of strings that have i y's in them is the number of ways to count an i-sized subset from n elements. This is the, the whole thing. This string, bijectively, can correspond to the set containing 6 and 9. Right? I'll put a little arrow here. For each string like that, there's a set like that. This string corresponds to the set containing 1, 2, right? So ci is equal to, we want, again, the number of strings of length n with exactly i y's in them. It's exactly equal to the number of ways to choose an i-sized subset from n elements. Now, the elements here are the indices in the string. You are looking at the positions in the string, and you're choosing i spots. That's exactly what? N choose i, n choose i QED. That, I think, is probably the hardest combinatorial argument you see. It's not too hard, but it is definitely a little bit of a wake-up call compared to the easy ones we did. You know, We were able to count the number of ways of strings of certain structure to just subsets of numbers. Not an easy bijection to make, but it is certainly true. right? Does anyone disagree with this? Any, any, anything unsatisfied or unclear about that? From here, we just plug a CI in there, and we get the answer that we wanted. Binomial theorem, very powerful. Let's do an application of it, of the binomial theorem. Um, uh, if A is finite, uh, what is the cardinality of the power set of A? Yeah. We proved this by actually a bijection to binary strings. If you recall, we, each string corresponds to that element being in the subset or not in the set subset, right? So in fact, there's a bijection between the power set of a finite set and the strings of length n if a has size n. We can actually give a combinatorial argument for this using the binomial theorem. Um, let the cardinality of a be n. Let's count the cardinality of the power set of A. Okay? We want to count the number of subsets of an n element set. How many subsets of size 0 are there of an n element set? 1. How many subsets of size 2 are there of an n element set? 4. Depends on n. What is the number of what is the number of sets of size two of an n element set? N choose two. In fact, you can just say that the number of ways to choose two elements from n elements is n choose two. I messed up on the one. I missed it. What is the number of ways to choose an element? The number a subset of size one from an n element set. Yeah. This is totally out of order. What's the number of ways to choose three elements from n elements? Yes. The number of ways to choose n elements from n elements? Yeah. This is actually, what is 1 equal to? Uh, what else is it equal to? n choose n. What is also n choose n equal to? No. n choose 1 is n. n choose 0. So this is actually just the sum of i is equal to 0 to n of n minus n choose i. Combinatorially, 
This is the number of subsets of size 3, number of subsets of size 4, number of subsets of size 5, number of subsets of size n. So the number of possible subsets is the sum of the choices of the size of the subsets, right? But this is actually just equal then to the sum of i is equal to 0 of n, n to the i, times 1 to the n minus i, times 1 to the i. Because 1 to anything is 1. What is this equal to by the binomial theorem? One plus one to the n. What is that? Two to the n. QED. We proved that there are two to the n subsets of an n element set. Now, is this proof longer and harder than the simple bijection to binary strings? And then you apply product rule? The product rule is easy, right? But it's an application of binomial theorem. You can do a lot of crazy things with binomial theorem. You can plug in negative x and y in the binomial theorem, right? Lots of, lots of interesting things can occur. Any questions? Binomial theorem? Yes. From the summation to the 1 plus 1. Ah, because 1 times anything is 1. You agree? Yes. So, 1, oh, oh, from this to this. This is simply the statement of the binomial theorem, which I'll write again. The statement of the binomial theorem is x plus y to the n is equal, and this is easy to memorize, i is equal to 0 to n, n choose i, times x to the n minus i, y to the i, right? So I simply said, well, that looks like this if I were to plug in x equals 1 and y equals 1. Here, this step requires the binomial theorem, right? Then from there it follows. In fact, you could do, like, you could try to see, like, an exercise, what happens if n is x is 2 and y is 1. Well, you would have 3 to the n is equal to something interesting, maybe, you know, something like this. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, also, by symmetry, this is, of course, equal to, we know this is equal to some many things. i is equal to 0 to n of n, choose n minus i times x to the i, y to the I, n minus i, and so on, right? There's other, many other ways to write the binomial theorem. Questions? All right, you guys have a great 4th of July. <laughs>